shall not be unpunished, and he that speaketh lies shall not escape. A false witness shall not be unpunished, and he that speaketh lies shall not escape. God is keeping track of shall not be unpunished, and he that speaketh lies shall not escape. A false witness shall not be unpunished, and he that speaketh lies shall not escape. Proverbs 19.5。Hello and welcome everybody to a new video from Juggler 66, Hour of the Truth. This one's called Hour of the Truth Meets Inquisition Update, the origin of futurism and preterism, and this is part 14 of our reading and, analy and analysis of this wonderful book that was written by two authors, Paul Owen, who wrote the first part dealing most of the time with preterism, or dealing with the origin of futurism and preterism, and Charles Jennings dealing with the last part, the tragic aftermath of futurism. And let's see where we arrive today. We, I mean, of course, myself and my brother in Christ, Tom Fress from Inquisition Update, who will again join me tonight for the reading and discussing, uh, or discussing of this wonderful little booklet. How are you doing, Tom? And welcome to the broadcast. I'm doing fine, and I'm very happy to be invited and very happy to be here. It's my pleasure, and I'm looking to get started. Me too. So without any further ado, let's pick it up where we left up yesterday. On the bottom of page 63, we start um, the last but one uh, part of this last chapter called The Two Witnesses. In Revelation 11, verses 3 through 12, is described the two witnesses with their work, their death and their resurrection. Maybe it's... Uh, not so unfitting to go into Revelation chapter 11 and read this verses 3 through 12 to get a little bit acquainted with it because not everybody knows the Bible by heart. I am for sure not one of them. So let's read Ch Revelation chapter 11 verses 3 through 12. Quote, and I will give power unto my two witnesses and they shall prophesy a thousand and two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. These have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy, and have power over waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them, and shall overcome them, and kill them. And the dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom in Egypt, where our Lord also was crucified. Where our Lord was crucified. And they of the people and kindreds of tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half, and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry, and shall send gifts one to another, because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. And after three days and a half the spirit of life from God entered into them, and they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon them which saw them. And they heard a great voice from heaven, saying unto them, Come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. This is quite interesting, especially since it is talking of three and a half days. And is speaking of um, 1,203 score days, 1,260 years. I'm mentioning that we often find back in the Bible, whether as 1,203 score days or 
time times and a dividing of time of 42 months or three and a half years and then you have this three and a half <coughs> days and so there must be some collection in that i am not that biblically scholar that i can tell you the exact meaning of all this and um, taking into consideration that the book of revelation is probably the most hard to understand book in all of the bible i think so because it deals even at our time that we are living in with still here and there future events and is not that easy to analyze would you happen to have any comment up to here tom or shall i just continue reading no, I'm going to confess off the top to your listeners and to you and to everyone else and even to myself. Much of the book of Revelation is yet a mystery to me, but it can be known. For those who seek, they find, and for those who ask, it is given unto them. And, and I ask the Lord for understanding of uh, this particular portion of uh, chapter 11 of uh, the book of Revelation. And uh, we'll see what the Protestant reformers believed and taught about these scriptures. Mm -hmm. That's the ones that I would trust before I would trust those who preach from the pulpits today. Oh, yeah, that's, that's for sure, yeah. Okay, so the author continues here. From the fundamentalist futuric and futuristic interpretation of Bible prophecy, it is commonly taught that the two witnesses are two men of the Old Testament era that have been resurrected or either the two men that did not die and therefore are brought back into their physical bodies and placed on this earth. Well, I think this explanation absolutely fits futurist. It comes to their wonderful uh, fairy tale uh, agenda of the uh, rapture also. It, it, it fits right in there. When you love fairy tales, just follow futurism. Mm -hmm. Ordinarily it is believed that the two witnesses are either Moses and Elijah, Elijah and Enoch, or Moses and Enoch. There is quite a dispute over the difference of opinion as to which of the two men of these three it will be. First, let us ascertain from the Old Testament who God refers to as his two witnesses. In Isaiah 43 verse 10 it is stated unto Jacob, which is inclusive of both houses of Israel, quote, Ye are my witnesses, saith God, and my servant, whom I have chosen. Unquote. The prophet is referring to Jacob, yet he says, Ye are, um, ye are my witnesses, which denotes a plurality of witnesses. In Isaiah 44, verse 8, it is stated, quote, Fear ye not, neither be afraid. Have not I told thee from that time, and have I have declared it? Ye are even my witnesses. Unquote. God is speaking to Jacob, his servant, that the family of Jacob are his witnesses. In Revelation 11, verse 3, the possessive pro, uh, personal pronoun my is used again, as it was in both scriptures in Isaiah. Does the Lord have different witnesses than what is stated in the Old Testament? No. His witnesses would be the same. In Psalm 114, verse 2, the psalmist speaks of Judah as being the Lord's sanctuary, while Israel as being his dominion. This denotes a twofold office of religious and civil authority within the family of Jacob. In Revelation 11, verse 4, we are given a strong clue as to the identity of these two witnesses by the reference to the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the whole earth. In Haggai 1 verse 1 and 14 is mentioned two men and their respective offices which were instrumental in the restoration of the city of Jerusalem after the Babylonian exile. Joshua the high priest and Zerubbabel the governor are the two men which are types of the two witnesses of Revelation 11. It is very significant to remember that the two God-given institutions that were re-established during this post-exilic era, era were civil authority under Zerubbabel, the governor, and religious authority under Joshua, the high priest. The parallel remains the same. Those two institutions are civil authority and religious authority under the dual office of the Messiah originally intended to be exercised through his church in his kingdom, 
Someday Jesus Christ will execute full authority in both of these offices as is reflected in his title, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. While allowing the scriptures to speak for themselves, we are given a clear understanding who the two witnesses are. While following the futuristic scream, quote-unquote Protestants remain in darkness and once again bow to the bidding of the Jesuits. So far for this part of the book. And um, interesting this last sentence where he says, quote-unquote, Protestants remain in darkness and once again bow to the bidding of the Jesuits. Wasn't it in this book that I read yesterday that when we have a um, when we have a history book in our hands that we can understand prophecy mm -hmm. I think it was here I don't find this in the book right now but <coughs> anyway this was uh, when I read this here do you have uh, some comments on this what I've just read Tom or shall we continue to the tragic aftermath of futurism I think it's just veiled uh, what he is saying when he says Protestants remain in darkness and once again bow to the bidding of the Jesuits. What he's saying is that Protestants have bought another Jesuit lie, that these two witnesses will be resurrected, resurrected Moses or Elijah uh, or, or, or Enoch. And uh, the Bible plainly tells us it's appointed unto man once to die and then the judgment. And uh, so we need to look for another solution. We need to look for a biblical solution. And this one that the authors uh, pre present to us are uh, worthy of consideration. And the popular teaching of the churches today are not to be trusted. So... While I admit openly and beforehand that I have much more study to do, I no longer hold much hope in uh, what is taught from the churches today, especially about these two witnesses. So that's what the author is suggesting, that we follow his lead and, and, and question what is put forward from the pulpits today, because they are tailored to facilitate the futurist interpretation of Daniel's 70th week. Mm. So the lies that come out from the pulpit today are even hard to identify unless we match very, very carefully, we compare very, very carefully what they preach with what the Scripture says. And so uh, just be aware that uh, all of the churches today are following they're Jesuit indoctrination. And uh, it's counter-reformationism. It's designed to destroy Protestantism and to, to uh, uh, cause people to follow carefully devised fables, which will ultimately lead to a global union under the papacy, mm -hmm. the biblical antichrist of the Bible. And the author is suggesting that the modern and popular teaching about these two witnesses that is being preached from the pulpits of the churches is not to be trusted. And we need to look elsewhere in the Scripture for the positive identification of these two witnesses. And I believe these authors come about as close as anything I've heard. Back to you, York. Yeah, thank you, Tom. So, we will start reading the last part of this book called The Tragic Aftermath of Futurism. When one considers the origin of futurism and its tragic results, the words of our Lord so clearly apply, quote, an enemy has done this, unquote, as we can read in Matthew, chapter 13, verse 28. The tragic aftermath has been a major departure from our historic Protestant faith. The tragic aftermath has been a major departure from sola scriptura, I dare to say. Mm -hmm. You know, there are a lot of things that we have to thank the reformers. And yeah. you could say that without them we wouldn't have the Bible today. Well, I think God always finds a way. 
But yes. the Reformation in that time, starting with Wycliffe, the morning star of the Reformation, um, was led by the hand of God. I as, don't question that. As the hand of God led the people of Israel out of Egypt from their bondage, he mm. led a lot of the reformers out of the bondage of the Roman Catholic Church into the freedom, into the peace with which, with which Christ has made us all free. That's true. And gave all of us his word. The dark ages were the dark ages, not because they didn't have a light in the evening to make some light in the house. They were called the dark ages because the people were kept in the dark. They were kept ignorant. There were no schools. There was no education. There were no books. And there was no word of God. And where there is no word of God, there is no light in the world, and that's because it is the Dark Ages. The Reformers brought us, or gave us, the possibility to read, to study, and to understand the word of God, which is his manual for us through life. In his word, in the Bible, and I prefer, and you know Tom too, the 1611 authorized version of the King James Bible. In that manual... God tells us where we come from, why we are here, and where do we go. And that manual of life, the people in the Dark Ages did not have. So when the Reformers popped up and the Bible was translated into the Volga, meaning the language of the people, and the people started reading that, they understood that Jesus had made them free and that Jesus paid it all at the cross with the fulfillment of Daniel's 70th week 2,000 years today ago. Yeah. But a lot of the reformers had a credo, sola scriptura. But when you read what the reformers later did, you understand that they did not adhere to it. Or even <coughs> they had different Bibles, different scriptures by which they adhered to. And that to me is the biggest flaw of the Reformation movement altogether. That they did not adhere to the Bible and the Bible alone. And that, my dear listener and viewer of this video, is the biggest problem of the quote-unquote Christians that we have today. If we Christians all adhere to the Bible and the Bible alone a hundred percent and do not go one inch to the right or one inch to the left, but adhere to the small path that Jesus sets, this small path that leads to salvation, and don't go off straying to the broad way that leads into perdition, if we really adhere to sola scriptura, it is an easy thing to live in this world. It is an easy thing, easy thing also to understand history and everything else. If we really go and understand sola scriptura. So when the author says here the tragic aftermath has been a major departure from our historic Protestant faith, he actually says or should say that it has been a major departure from the Bible. That's right. Because we do not adhere to the Bible anymore. And we don't measure our neighbor to the Bible. And not only our neighbor that lives next door to us, but also our neighbor that is a so-called mayor in the city, or that is so-called senator in Congress, or that is a so-called president of one country or chancellor of one country or whatever. We don't mm -hmm. measure the people in quote unquote authoritative um, institutions and positions. We don't measure them with the Bible. And that is the biggest flaw, in my opinion. That's right. But I guess that you have something to add here, Tom. No, I couldn't have said it better. <laughs> okay. <laughs> The Bible is no longer the standard for measuring of righteousness in this country or the world. And for those who seek answers from the Bible, 
99 times, 99 chances out of 100, they pick the wrong Bible. It's not a Bible at all. And we go back to the original point. If you want to know what God has to say to his people, you better pick up a King James Bible. Because the other Bibles can't even agree with themselves, let alone agree with the King James Bible. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the truth in our generation is like finding a needle in a haystack. And uh, I, I believe if anything marks the soon return of Christ, that's it. That they've made the, the, the authentic word of God, the infallible word of God, almost impossible to find. I'm told that when one goes to a Bible bookstore to purchase a Bible, sometimes they even have to special order a King James Bible. And so if you're fortunate of God and blessed of God to own a copy of the authentic authorized King James Bible, I think if I were you, I would burn the others and keep them and read and study and learn from that one. So it, they've, they've departed from God's truth because they've departed from his word. And because they've departed from his word, they're bound to be led astray. All the other Bibles are designed to lead us away from the truth. And so if you seek light and enlightenment and truth and salvation, trust the King James and no other. Okay, back to you, Yerk. The false predictions and vain speculations about the future have diverted Christians from the centrality of Christ to a daily political watch. The high-profile rapturists have become nothing more than newspaper quote-unquote prophets for profit. Prophecy has become a lucrative economic market. Hardcore dispensational futurism in its blind devotion to the modern political Zionist state of Israel is redefining Christianity into a religious, political and military campaign to bring about their desired Armageddon. By this they, intended, they intend to speed up the rapture for the saints, which is utterly ridiculous. Now these mm -hmm. two last sentences are so important, I have to read it again, that you understand it very well. It's, it's worthy of rereading. Yeah. Hardcore dispensational futurism in its blind devotion to the modern political Zionist state of Israel. What is every American president vouching when he comes into office? I will defend Israel. I will stand for Israel. Yeah. Only once, Tom, I would love that he would speak of the spiritual, true Israel. Yes, my I would as well. As a matter of fact, the current abomination in the White House uh, today, the, the current futurist, the current papist in the White House today, Donald Trump, has announced publicly that he plans to make a, uh, a quick sojourn to the quote-unquote Holy Land, and he's going to visit the Wailing Wall and going to follow his little dictator in Rome, and uh, where all the emphasis is placed now on uh, the restoration of the nation state of Israel, when the Bible is talking about the Israel of God. That's all believers. And the only reason in the world that this nation state called Israel today on the eastern, uh, on the western shore, uh, eastern shores of the Mediterranean is so that the papacy can re full, can can counterfeit a refulfillment of Daniel's 70th week it's the only reason it exists today i mean you can't have a, a, an antichrist confirming a covenant with the jews in a rebuilt nation state of Israel and a rebuilt temple, allowing sacrifices and oblations. Uh, and then after three and a half years, 
uh, cause those sacrifices and oblations to cease. You see, that's all the 70th week of Daniel, which Christ fulfilled 2,000 years ago. It's all a lie, every bit of it. There's nothing biblical or scriptural about the modern nation state of Israel. God uses the word Israel to describe those who he has called and those who he has chosen, those who he has sanctified, those who he has justified, and those who he will glorify. That's the Israel of God. And uh, he made a covenant with us in his own blood. And he confirmed that covenant in the midst of the week, the 70th and final week of Daniel's prophecy. And we have salvation in him. He has put away sin because he bore it on his own body. He paid our sin debt completely. And we are saved, okay? And what Rome wishes the whole world to do is to deny that Jesus was the fulfillment of that 70th and final week of Daniel's prophecy. And then at least as much as God will allow perform a counterfeit of that 70th week of Daniel. And to lead the whole world astray. The Pope wants to make all of us Jews who reject Jesus Christ. Yes. Yes. That's one way of putting it. And uh, the whole Christian world believes in this. All of their hopes lie in the modern nation state of Israel. And that's just how deceived the Christian world is. How far would one have to look to find one who understands what you and I understand, that the modern nation state of Israel as it exists today is a counterfeit. It's, it's a stage upon which the papacy hopes to assume himself to be the Christ, the Messiah. It's the papacy in conjunction with the state of Israel of Israel in conjunction with the state of Europe in conjunction with the state of the United States and England and everyone else to create this modern nation state of Israel in 1948 so that they can perform this future 70th week of Daniel so that they can lead the whole world to astray and steer them away from the literal fulfillment of that 70th week of Daniel 2,000 years ago and Christ. They wish to erase the hope of our salvation in Jesus and put the hope of salvation in someone else. And the papacy's been orchestrating this almost since the very beginning. And now it's a reality in the world. And everybody thinks it's the fulfillment of Bible prophecy. Show me. And you'd be hard pressed, you'd be hard pressed to convince anyone otherwise. Show me that Bible prophecy, Tom. Show me the Bible prophecy? Yeah. Daniel's seventieth week? No, no, that Bible prophecy of a restored nation state of Israel. It doesn't exist. Exactly. <laughs> it's not in the Bible. No, it's, it's not, not in the Bible. It comes forth from the puppets and from the from the the uh, altars of the Roman Catholic Church. These are fabrications by the father of lies in Rome. That's why it's so These are, that's why okay, it's so important. That's, right. that's why it's so important as the author says here, hardcore dispensational futurism in its blind devotion to the modern political yeah. Zionist state of Israel. Yeah. It's even redefining Christianity into a religious, political and military campaign to bring about their desired Armageddon. Well, that's it yeah. all about their desired Armageddon. Because what do they want? What does the Roman Catholic Church want already since 2,000 years? The Jews annihilated. Yes. And they are building a big concentration camp over there in the Middle East 
and the people that's even, what it is even, and the people even go there voluntarily yeah like the sheep go to the slaughterhouse the papacy has made the nation state of israel to be on a national scale what hitler tried to do to the jews during the second world war it's just a huge concentration camp for the jews to cause them to eat and drink damnation to themselves once again by making animal sacrifices thus assuring the world that they still reject jesus yeah first spiritual damnation tom and then and physical, then physical. Damnation. yep and not only to be the solution to the final jewish question but to lead all protestants astray in support of it that's right they're all hoping and praying in in placing their hopes in this future nation state of israel or the current nation state of israel on the eastern shore of the mediterranean they're hoping for the Jews to begin animal sacrifices again, to build a temple in which God will never dwell, to offer sacrifices that God will never consume. And it, the whole system was destroyed 2,000 years ago in 70 AD when the Jews finally rejected their Messiah. The gospel went to the Gentiles, and God sent the Roman 10th Legion to permanently destroy that temple. It has no function in the world anymore. Now we are the temple of the living God. That's what the Bible says. There's no biblical call whatsoever for a new temple to be built in a rebuilt, restored nation state of Israel. And there's no hope for any Jew that lives there but to eat, drink, and, uh, to eat and drink damnation to himself and to fall prey to the Antichrist. Jesus plainly said, I came in my, he was speaking to the Jews of his day. He said, I came in my father's name and you received me not. There's one who comes after me who will come in his own name. That is a name that the father did not give him. And him you will receive. Well, who is it that comes in the name of Christ, but in a name that the father did not give him? The papacy, he calls himself the vicar of Christ. He comes in the name of Christ, but that isn't the name that God gave him. God gave him the name Antichrist. And it's the papacy, the Antichrist of the Bible, that Rome is going to be, re that is going to receive Rome. And all the Protestants in this church, those who call themselves Protestants, are all for this. They think the Jews are going to receive their Messiah, but it's not going to be Jesus. Israel was a masterpiece of the papacy. The nation state of Israel is a masterpiece of deception. And the third Authored temple will the, be the crown of that masterpiece, or the sugar coating on it. Absolutely. <clears throat> and the whole Christian world is anticipatory of the rebuilding of this temple, the reinstitution of the Aaronic uh, uh, sacrificial system, and then the breaking of the covenant, the treaty that allows the Jews to build that temple and allows them to begin animal sacrifices again. And then the papacy is going to pin the onus of the Antichrist upon the one who, who, who violates that treaty and causes the sacrifices and oblations to cease then the whole Christian world will be convinced and there'll be no way to change their minds that that man is the Antichrist. So what does that leave open for the papacy? The position, to be the savior. The position of Messiah. The, the position of Messiah, to take the position that he has always claimed for himself, the replacement of the Son of God on earth. So they can choose anyone they want to sell uh, to, to, to sign a seven-year peace treaty with the Jews, who that's going to be is going to be revealed in history. 
But I'm here to tell you that when there is a seven-year peace treaty signed with the Jews, and then three and a half years later, that treaty is broken, whoever offered that treaty to Israel and broke that treaty after three and a half years is going to be marked by the entire Christian world, Catholic, Protestant, Evangelical, you name them, they're all going to be unrepentingly convinced that that man is the Antichrist. And, and the papacy can choose anybody it wants to perform that role at any time they want. Whenever the situation is such in Israel that this hoax can be pulled off, it's going to go like clockwork unless God sticks a, a, a wrench in the works. I don't know just how perfectly God is going to allow that prophecy to be refulfilled by the papacy. I can't believe that God's going to allow it to be so perfect that it can't be seen as a, a hoax and phony by his Bible reading, Bible understanding, Bible trusting people. But we see the stage being set since 1948 for this, the greatest deception since the Garden of Eden. That's what I call it. The greatest deception for the garden uh, since the Garden of Eden. Israel is just the stage for deception and corruption and popery. They have been training for these deceptions all along, you know. 1941, yes. the attack on Pearl Harbor. Yeah. September 11th, 2001. Yeah. Everybody who watched it bought it. Yeah. Yeah, they've got the people completely eating from their hands. Whatever whatever nonsense they feed us, the American people just gobble it right up. The people are conditioned, Tom. Yes, they're conditioned they to are, believe their masters. They are conditioned and they are held under a... Um, Delusion. Under, uh, under, under a phony authority. I was looking for that word phony. Under a phony authority yeah. because... There should not be authority above us than Jesus Christ. Uh -huh. Christians are all on the same level. But yeah. people accept th these other authorities, and these authorities have then again to keep their authority, and they will do anything to do that, and they will lie, and they will cheat, and they will deceive. As they have done in the past, they will do in the future the same way. And the, and the authority of all authorities on the earth today is the papacy. And that's what people do not want to see because they don't yeah. they don't watch the Roman Catholic Church as the political power that it actually represents. Yeah. And um, maybe even on the danger of repeating myself, but going to the archives of First Amendment Radio and listen to Tom's reading of the Global Vatican that he read in 2015 and a good part of 2016, of former ambassador to the quote-unquote Holy See Francis Rooney between 2005 and 2008, who boasts of the political right. power of the uh, of the uh, of the Vatican, he boasts yeah. about it. There is yeah. no question that the Roman Catholic Church, first and for all, is a political power that has all the kings, means the presidents and the kings and chancellors and prime ministers of this world in her pocket. They all right. go to Rome and kiss the Pope's ring. Why That's do you right. think they do that? Because they like the taste of a pedophile hand? Or yeah. because they are showing their sub the submission to the self-styled Lord of Lord and King of Kings? on this earth. Yep. Yep. The, yep. the timing, the, the author continues here, the timing for the coming of Christ is reserved and determined by God alone, as you can read in Acts chapter 1 verse 7, quote, and he said unto them, it is not for you to know the times of or the seasons which the Father has put in his own power, unquote. Modern apostate Christianity and this is underlined by the author here, along with underlined Zionistic Judaism and underlined radical Islam, 
are the quote-unquote free and clean spirits like frogs that we learn of in Revelation chapter 16 verses 13 through 14 gathering the nations to battle gathering no. the nations to their damnation that's right modern, let, let, yeah modern ahead, just ahead. a second modern apostate christianity take easter christmas and i don't know what else can you take away these two take t just take these two away and what is left of quote unquote christianity in the world what sunday. is modern christianity yeah sunday yeah oh, also yeah okay sunday easter and christmas take these three away and this is everything a, a christian today identifies in himself with take this away and what does he have left nothing nothing where there should be the bible modern apostate christianity that's the word and where does the apostate christianity come from it comes from apostate protestantism it comes from those people who in the first place identified worldwide for everybody to see the papacy as the antichrist and they have gone apostate with the ecumenical movement gone back under the wings of rome Apostate Christianity, Zionistic Judaism, and Radical Islam are the three unclean spirits like frogs. Think about that. Now, I'd like to make a point, too, about this paragraph. Please. The author says the timing for the coming of Christ is reserved and determined by God alone. See Acts chapter 1, verse 7. The coming of Christ... The, the first coming of Christ was, as the author said, reserved and determined by God alone. And that determination of Christ's first coming was given to Daniel in his prophecy in chapter 9. That was the precise timing of the coming of Messiah. If you carefully studied when the decree went forward to restore and to re rebuild Jerusalem, it says, and the coming of Messiah shall be seven weeks of years and 62 weeks of years. That's 69 weeks of years together combined, or 483 literal years. So at the very least, for those who even study Daniel's prophecy superficially, would understand that in 483 literal years from the going forth of that command to restore to rebuild Jerusalem to Messiah the Prince would be exactly 483 years. You could tell the literal year, all right, that he would, the, the end of the 69th week, Messiah would come. So now you have it narrowed down to days, right? Yeah, because you can even say, the time when Christ was born when you understand Daniel 9 because it says that in the middle of the 70th week he gives up his life and he yeah. was anointed uh, three and a half years before that means when yeah. he is 30 yeah so that when he means was that about you can, 30 years old the scripture says yeah, that, that yeah because that was so in the uh, in, in the um, in the law of Moses it was ordained that yes. uh, you had to be 30 years before you could become a rabbi Yes. So and 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 okay. with and with uh, writing this that that he was uh, that he was anointed at thirty years and three and a half years later, that he stopped the sacrifices and oblations to cease. You knew yeah. when when he was born. You could count that yeah. out. Now let me point out to your listeners, what is believed by futurists. Now knowing that God t gave to Daniel through the through the Archangel Gabriel, the precise timing of the coming of Messiah. We know equally well from the Scripture that Christ's second coming will come as a thief in the night. Yeah. All right? It's not given to us to know the day or the hour of Christ's second coming. That's what it says in the Scriptures. The precise timing of his first coming was absolutely known. The precise timing of his second coming is unknown even to the Son himself. 
even to Christ himself. He says so in the scripture. Yeah, because he submitted but his will to the Father, and that's why that's he right. didn't know. Because there are a lot of people, Tom, who attack this verse in the Bible and say, well, if Jesus didn't, uh, couldn't say when he was coming back, then he is not God. Yeah, yeah of course he is well, God, but he submitted himself entirely... to the power of the Father who was in heaven at that's that right. time. And, and that's the difference, and that's why he didn't tell us that time of the coming back. And also, well, when, when, if, if you knew the time of the coming back, you could, <laughs> you could sin until the day before mm -hmm. and live an ungodly life and then all of a sudden turn to Christ or what? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's not, that's not how it is supposed to be, right? No. No, that's not how it's supposed to be. But what I'm trying to point out to the listeners is if you believe, as do all the futurists, all the Zionists that have all their hopes in Israel, what you believe is that precisely 1260 days after the Antichrist makes this makes and breaks this covenant with the Jews and causes the sacrifices and oblations to cease, from, from marking from that day, 1260 days or three and a half years the second half of the futurist 70 week of, of Daniel Messiah will come they they know precisely when Jesus is going to come the second time listen again what the author says the timing of the coming of Christ is reserved and determined by God alone Acts chapter 1 verse 7 and we know from the Bible that God gave to Daniel the precise timing of the first coming of Christ. And no one, not even Christ himself, is given the pre precise time of his second coming. But if you ask a futurist when Jesus is going to come, they'll tell you exactly 1,260 literal days after the breaking of the covenant with the Jews, causing the sacrifices and oblations to cease. Now, I've just exposed to you the very recipe for proving their apostasy, okay? What does the author say now? He says, modern apostate Christianity, along with Zionistic Judaism and radical Islam, are the three unclean spirits like frogs. Who's he talking about? At least from the Christians... He's talking about those who believe they know the precise timing of the coming of the Messiah. They're wrong. They want to be smarter as God. They want to be smarter than God. You see, that's how the Jesuit priests get so much accolade in the world. That's where all this comes from. They take credit for it. And they're nothing but fools. And they've led the whole world astray. They've caused the whole world to believe a lie. Now, there's many people that, 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 that say, well, the Jesuits are the most holy of the holy priests of Rome. They're the most diabolical of all the diabolical priests of Rome. That's the truth. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, I'm going to tell you, God left no one to doubt when Messiah would come the first time. We know that Simeon was at the temple the morning that, ne Mo uh, that uh, Joseph and Mary brought the Jesus, brought this Messiah to be circumcised according to the law. Did you remember what he said? Mine eyes have beheld the salvation of Israel. That's what he said. He was expecting the Messiah. And we even have the example of uh, Andrew, I believe it was, who was actively looking for the Messiah. Well, how could they know? Daniel's prophecy. The only way they could know. They were waiting for their Messiah. They were expectant of their Messiah. They knew the calendar date had arrived that Daniel prophesied. Well, and Jesus go, literally goes out of his way in the New Testament to say that the day of his second coming is not going to be known. But the futurists who have bought the Jesuit lie of futurism, they can tell you precisely to the day when Jesus is going to come back. That exposes 
their deception and their apostasy right then and there. You don't have to look any further. Back to you, Jürgen. And again, that teaching, Tom, is exactly 180 degrees opposite to what the Bible teaches. You know, interesting also in the, in the, in the case of Daniel is uh, that we have to consider that there are many, many prophecies in the Old Testament, made throughout the Old Testament, of the coming of a Messiah. But there is only one prophecy that nails it to the day. That's right. And that's Daniel 9. Yep. That's it. So the author continues here, very influential dispensational futurist ministers are helping to determine our national foreign policy, especially in Middle Eastern affairs. So I think that the author here is uh, speaking about our national foreign policy, speaking about the United States of America. And well, two, this, names, yes, uh, and two he, names are popping up directly in my mind. Zbigniew Brzezinski and Henry yes. Kissinger. Both of them. Absolutely. Both of them. Henry Kissinger being a special envoy to the Vatican. That's Did right. Did you know that, my dear listener? <laughs> and he is already a, a special advisor on foreign policy to the American president since the early 1970s. That's more than 40 years already. Yes. In and there, how about Zbigniew Brzezinski? He's a knight of Malta. Yeah, yeah. And He's sworn an oath. He has sworn an oath to elevate the papacy to global supremacy. That's what a knight of Malta is sworn to do. And that's what Zbigniew Brzezinski does. He's, he's a Vatican insider. And he's a CIA operative. And they determine the foreign and domestic policy for the United States, them and a whole lot of other people like them. And they're all papists. And they're all Zionists because their future, their hope is to fulfill as precisely as they possibly can a phony counterfeit 70th week of Daniel. That's their whole motivation to lead the whole world astray. And it looks like most Christians in America, if not all, are predisposed to believe their lie. They've been, they've been taught futurism from the pulpits of our churches since the early 1800s. And so they were taught the same lies in Great Britain. Two of the most powerful Protestant nations in the world have been totally deceived and are now anticipata anticipatory of this future fulfillment of Daniel's 70th week. It's all a lie, everything. And none of it would be possible unless first there was the creation of the modern nation state of Israel. And then so bitterly persecuting the Jews all over the world that they would flee to that man-made nation state of Israel so that there would be an immediate demand for the restoration of the temple so that they might make animal sacrifices again. Since they rejected Christ, they've had no sacrifice, no temple, no nothing to reinstitute that system confirming that they reject Christ to this day and the papacy is going to use all of this to its advantage in a refulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel the nation state of Israel was absolutely necessary to have Jews living in the land by any means fair or foul they persecuted the Jews and then gave them a, 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 a a concentration camp on the eastern shores of the Mediterranean to flee to, helping them to defeat their enemies in the area so that they could have Temple Mount and a temple built and to begin animal sacrifices again, and then they can have their futurist fulfillment. 
the State Department of the United States, the Defense Department of the United States, the Federal Reserve Bank is all part of it. The presidency, the Congress, both the House and the Senate are part of it. All the churches in the United States are part of it. And woe be to them when their eyes are finally open to the deception that they've bought hook, line, and sinker. They've literally, they've literally paved the way for a counterfeit fulfillment of Daniel's 70th week, and that can be for no other purpose than to reject Jesus as the fulfillment of it 2,000 years ago and present to the world a, a false Christ. Now, I know this is complicated to people that may be hearing this for the first time. If you have any questions, write me, tom at cwaves.us. Yurt can explain this as well as I can. You have his contact information. Again, my email address is tom at cwaves, that's S-E-A-W-A-V-E-S dot U-S. Okay, back to you, Yurk. Yeah, thank you, Tom. You know, they paved the yellow brick road to perdition for That's all right. the apostate Christianity. Mm -hmm. In their misguided zeal, the author continues, they are calling, they meaning the dispensational futurist ministers, they are calling for a war of quote-unquote end-time apocal uh, apocalyptic proportions with Islam and <clears throat> Uh, with Islam in order to protect the modern political Zionist state of Israel. They view political Zionism as fulfillment of Bible prophecy while being totally captivated by the Jewish God's chosen people myth. Now, Futurism also advocates a rebuilt Jewish temple, including the Levitical animal sacrifices. In order to expedite the building of this new temple and the reinstitution of animal sacrifices, runaway futurists are on the lookout for a perfect red heifer. Some American <coughs> cattle ranchers are feverishly working through scientific means to produce a red heifer. Nowhere does the Bible teach there will be a rebuilt Jewish temple. The body of Christ, the church, is the true temple, nows, of God. Quote, know ye not that ye are the temple of God? Unquote. As we can read in 1 Corinthians 3, verses 16 through 17, 6, verses 19 through 20. The whole context of the book of Hebrews tells us that there is only one sacrifice for sin. That is the sacrifice that Jesus performed 2,000 right. years ago. That's right, during the 70th the week of Daniel. During Praise the his 70th holy name. week of Daniel. Yeah. Yes, indeed. That is the substitutionary... Oh, God, I hate this word. Substitutionary. <laughs> Thank you. The substitutionary death. <laughs> okay. Yes. Thanks. That is the substitutionary death and blood sacrifice of Jesus Christ, as we can read in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 27, chapter 9, verse 6 through 15, and also in verse 28. Any other blood sacrifice, any other blood sacrifice for any reason, would be blasphemy and insult to the spirit of grace and the blood of Jesus. Now, can I make a comment oh, please, here? Tom. <clears throat> It says any other blood sacrifice, that is an animal sacrifice, we take a live animal and sacrifice his, shed his blood on the, on, the, on the temple mount. That's what the animal sacrifices would do. But I would add to this, any other bloodless sacrifice is also equally rejected because the Bible says without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. And in the Roman Catholic Church, Every time they sacrifice the mass, they call it a bloodless sacrifice. And most people don't realize this, but in the Roman Catholic mass, the priest is said to have the power to create his creator. And he elevates the round wafer of the mass. It's made of, of flour. It's made by hands. 
by man's hands. It's flour and water and something else, a little oil, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. And they're fashioned into a, a round disc, a round, flat disc. It's a piece of unleavened bread. I think there's a bit of salt they put in it. And when the priest elevates this piece of bread, holds it high over his head, he says five magic Latin words, hoc es in his corpus meus, that is, this is the body of Christ. And at that point, they ring a little bell in the back of the church, and that's when Jesus is said to come off of his throne at the right hand of the Father and physically occupy that piece of bread. And at that point, the priest has created his creator. This is the real, this is the whole Christ body, soul, and divinity, the whole Christ, whole and entire, okay? And then during the Mass, the priest consecrates the, 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 the wine, and then he breaks and eats the sacrifice. It's called a sacrifice. It's called a perpetual sacrifice that Jesus must have often to be sacrificed over and over and over again. And this is how literally grace is infused to the Roman Catholic. Everyone participates in this mass. Everyone gets to eat the bread. Of course, only the priest gets to drink the wine, but everybody eats of this abomination. And it's called a sacrifice, a bloodless sacrifice, according to the Roman Catholic Church. Now, what from the scripture can you determine from that? It's all a diabolical lie. It has nothing whatsoever to do with Jesus Christ at all. It is blasphemy to say that they can crucify Christ afresh. The Roman Catholic Church is as anti-Christian as any church can get. It is the synagogue of Satan. It is straight from the pit of hell. It is perdition itself. And it awaits God's judgment. And don't look to reform that church because Scripture, Bible prophecy indicates that it won't be destroyed until Christ returns. And it cannot be reformed. And that's the error that the Protestant reformers built. They named themselves reformers because they thought, futilely, they thought that they could reform that church or that they could, form, they could force that church to reform. And history has proven it's irreformable. So no sacrifice, whether a blood sacrifice or a bloodless sacrifice, is going to be accepted by God. Only the sacrifice of his son. Only the sacrifice of his son. Only the son who was sacrificed 2,000 years ago, just as Daniel prophesied in the midst of the week, the 70th week of Daniel's prophecy. That's the truth. That's the biblical, historical, and prophetic truth. Any talk of a future 70th week of Daniel or any talk of any future portion of that 70th week is a lie straight from perdition. And it's taught in all the churches. I dare you to find another church that preaches the truth from the gospel of Almighty God, from the King James Bible. Back to you, Yerk. Any other blood sacrifice than that of Jesus Christ for any reason would be blasphemy and insult to the spirit of grace and the blood of and, Jesus. And what does it say about the Roman Catholic Church in, in Revelation chapter 17? And I saw on her forehead a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And blasphemy is the first, the middle, and the last name of the Roman Catholic Church. It is the church of blasphemy. It brings to naught the God of the Bible. It sacrifices him over and over and over again. It commands people to confess their sins in the ear of a sin-sick pedophile priest. There's no salvation in the Roman Catholic Church. And nothing that come out, comes out of that church is anywhere near a, the truth. Futurism and dispensationalism came out of the Roman Catholic Church. Free will came out of the Roman Catholic Church. 
All the lies come from the Roman Catholic Church. They call him Holy Father. What he is is the father of lies. The only thing that he has fathered in this world is lies and blasphemy. And there's no hope for him. There's no reformation of him or his church. And I fear that those churches that are now ecumenically reuniting, there's no repentance in them either. That's what's so fearful to me. Back to you, Yerk. Now the author continues, the advocates of this practice are those, quote, who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God, and hath counted the blood of the covenant, wherewith he was sanctified, an unholy thing, and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace, as we can read in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 26 through 29. The futurist approach to the prophecy of Scripture does an enormous injustice, not only to proper biblical exegesis, but also common sense in understanding the development of human affairs. Well, therefore you have to take away the common sense of the people and you have reached your goal. Eh? That's right. And that's what they have reached with all their propaganda and indoctrination of Jesuitical life from cradle to grave. Since what they have done is re reduced them to brute beasts, yeah. unable to comprehend. They're dumb as dogs. Now that sounds insulting. I don't, I'm not here to insult anybody. I'm the first to admit, for 50 years of my life, I was a futurist. This is all I was ever taught my whole life. If, if what I said applies to Christianity today, it, it applied to me for the first 50 years of my Christian life. Dumb as a dog. Common sense, the plain reading of the Scripture makes far more sense than the fables they preach from the pulpits. And I was dumb as a dog to believe that lie. So if anybody wants to accuse me of being insulting, remember, I insulted myself first. Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, thanks, Tom. It's unrealistic attempt to squeeze the vast majority of Revelation events into seven short years. You know, they want to put the whole history of the Roman Catholic Church that is from at least 300 and some 20 years after Christ up to today, they want to squeeze all this time into seven short years. With a strict literal application, defies both logic and biblical typology. Though it is this interpretation that is the most popular and financially rewarding. When one understands the historical viewpoint of the book of Revelation as the prophetic outline of the history of God's true covenant people Israel, it brings all of prophecy into proper focus. Nowhere, absolutely nowhere, does the Bible teach a rapture of the saints to fly away to another planet called heaven. What the Bible does teach is that Jesus Christ is returning to this earth to remain. He will then possess his kingdom. The resurrection of the saints will take place as he returns in glory and power. His coming results in resurrection and immorality, not yeah, in a Im rapture. Immortality. Immortality. Immortality, yeah, what did I say? That's immorality, but that's all right. I make the same mistakes on my program. Yeah, yeah, that's right, yeah. Okay. This is when the this is when the Bible says this mortal must take on immortality. This corrupt must this take. This is the resurrection. This is not talking about a rapture that does not exist in the Bible. That's a fable, a carefully devised fable by the Jesuits to get you to swallow futurism. Mm -hmm. And so that if you ever n discover that futurism is a lie, you still won't spit it out of your mouth because you want to hang on to the rapture. You see, you want to believe in that false hope. The rapture is a lie. 
the Bible speaks of one resurrection for the righteous and one resurrection for the damned. Okay? You'll find no scriptural evidence whatsoever in the Bible for a rapture. It does not exist. It exists only in the diabolical mind of the Jesuits and in the, and in the totally deceived mind of the Protestant seminarians who have been indoctrinated with this Jesuit lie and now preach it from the pulpits till they've deceived and deluded the whole world. His coming results in resurrection and immortality, not in a rapture. That's, that's, that's the important thing to remember. All right, Yerk. The whole teaching of Jesuit-inspired futurism has tragically resulted in, first, the forsaking of true biblical prophecy and chronology. Second, blinding the church as to who God's true people Israel are. Third, a departure from the Protestant faith of our forefathers. Four, accepting an alternative means of salvation for the Jewish people. Fifth, a theology of abdication of God's sovereign power to Quote unquote, the Antichrist. And sixth, an attitude of apathy and defeat while waiting for quote unquote, escape or rapture. And seventh, total ignorance of Christ's coming kingdom, reign of righteousness on the earth, as we can read in Luke chapter 1, verses 30 to 33. The main purpose of prophetic utterances of Scripture is not to generate fear and uncertainty about the future, but to reveal the Lord Jesus Christ in all his glory and majesty. All true prophecy glorifies our Lord Jesus, because, quote, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy, unquote, as we can read in Revelation chapter 19, verse 10. And this finishes the reading of the booklet, The Origin of Futurism and Preterism. It's been quite a journey, Tom. In the, yes, in the beginning, I did not expect this taking this long, and looking back, it, for me, <laughs> could have taken double the time. I enjoyed every minute of reading this and discussing this wonderful little booklet with you. And reading for once from another source than your teaching everything that you have been teaching the last 10 years or even more yeah it's wonderful and uh, of course because of that i ordered some other books i received last week a book from ralph woodrow who we probably all know and you know i read on my channel his uh, babylon mystery religion that was written in 1966 and I received a book from him from 1971 Great Prophecies of the Bible The Second Coming of Christ Matthew 24, The Seventy Weeks and The Antichrist and maybe in the future Tom I will invite you <laughs> maybe we can do that in the future I want to invite you to read that book together with me also when, be interesting. when we have the possibility that would be very interesting to do but first of all, of course, I think uh, that you have some uh, concluding remarks on the book, on the last little reading that we did, and uh, have maybe a last message for our what, uh, viewers of the video and listeners to the audio. Yes, I would tell your listeners <clears throat> that there was nothing in this broadcast intended to offend uh, the truth should never offend the, the saints. If we be offended by the truth, then we're offended by Christ. God warned us in the scripture. He said, I tell you beforehand, you're going to be persecuted. You're going to be lied to. You're going to be deceived. You're going to be treated as I was treated, wounded in the house of my friends. 
And that's our lot. God told us beforehand. If they hated him, they're going to hate us. And they've tried as best they can to deceive us. And God has redeemed us from that deception. Those of us who no longer believe in futurism. We hold to the historical interpretation of Bible prophecy. Knowing that history is simply the fulfillment of Bible prophecy. And when God prophesies a thing to happen, we see it fulfilled in history. And that prophecy of the Bible encompasses the entire Christian era. And that the coming of the Antichrist was one of the first things that took place in the Christian era, not at the end of time. The man of sin, the son of perdition, the little horn of Daniel was revealed as soon as the restrainer was taken out of the way. Paul said, he who now letteth or restraineth will restrain until he is taken out of the way. That was 2,000 years ago when Paul said, he who now restrains. We know from history that power that restrained the rise of the papacy was the Caesars of Rome. And when the Roman Empire fell, immediately upon its heels arose the man of sin, the son of perdition, the one who would deceive the whole world, the one who would persecute the saints of Almighty God, the ones who would wear out the saints of the Most High. And history has verified every element of those prophecies fulfilled in the papacy. There's not another candidate in the whole history of the world that even comes close. The man of sin is a dynasty. It's an office. The man of sin is not just one individual. The man of sin is a whole nearly 15, 1800 years of successive popes holding the office of the Antichrist, the man of sin. He's the most powerful political and religious leader in the world by its own admission. It controls and has controlled the kings and the governments of the world almost throughout the entire Christian history. We need not look to a future Antichrist. He's been with us all the time. We need not look forward to a future nation state of Israel. We are the Israel of God. God no longer dwells in temples made with hands. He dwells in us. We are the temple of the Holy Ghost. So now you have much to pray about and much to read about and much to repent of. I did. And with God's help, you can too. And that's for what I pray. God grant you grace. God grant you mercy. And God grant you his truth in the scriptures and the scriptures alone. Sola scriptura. Solo gracias. Solo Christos. Thanks for having me, Yerk. And blessings in the name of the one who caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease 2,000 years ago. Jesus Christ, our Lamb and the Messiah of God, the one who bears the sin of the world and redeemed us all to God. He is the one and the true and the only King of kings and Lord of lords. And I look for his soon return. But I'm afraid that before he returns, the whole world will be deceived by this futurist abomination. And now you know who the author of it was and for what purpose. The author of it was the father of lies in Rome and his Jesuits. So let us repent and return to the historicist interpretation of Bible prophecy and the authorized King James Bible. And let's let God heal the wounds. In Jesus' name, 
I pray for all who are listening. Thanks, Yerk, and I'll see you next time. Yeah, thank you very much, Tom, for your moving words at the end of this broadcast. And thank you also for devoting more than 20 hours to come to sit with me here, read and discuss this booklet, The Origin of Futurism and Preterism. You know, dear listener and dear viewer of the video, the idea of Tom and me sitting here together and reading and discussing this book is not, as he pointed out already, to put the blame on you or, or, or to, 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 to point fingers uh, because we all have been betrayed. I mean, I'm almost 51 years old and uh, for more than 45 years I did not believe in the God who created this world um, because I was more or less in the fangs of Satan. And finally God tipped me on the shoulders and told me to open the door and let him in. And because I was seeking the truth, I let him in. And I'm so glad that he found me, as glad as Tom is that he found him also. And if you want to support Tom, um, well, I don't know whenever we will go back here on uh, Hour of the Truth Meets Inquisition Update, because he has a very busy schedule and I can understand that. But uh, you can follow his daily work on Inquisition Update that he does on First Amendment Radio and the playlists of his frequent and of his uh, of his of his frequently done and also of his current work are included in the description box of this video. He is for the moment reading the book "The Foundations Under Attack," with its, uh, which is actually the second part of "All Roads Lead to Rome" from Michael de Semlian. And um, when you want to support him, then support First Amendment Radio, who pays the bills for his daily show up there. And then you can follow Tom's teaching and to understand probably, if possible, even deeper than we did from this reading, the futurism and the origin of futurism and preterism, the greatest lie since the deception, uh, since the Garden of Eden, this great deception that has been laid by Satan and his minions who are transformed. Satan is transformed into an angel of light and therefore it is no miracle that also his ministers are transformed into ministers of righteousness. And we all have been following these because we are taught from the beginning to accept their authority and to adhere to their authority. Until God tips us on the shoulder and gets us out of there, we must come out of Babylon, as in Revelation 18, chapter, uh, chapter 18, verse 4, God says, Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of, uh, of her sins, and yet they do not um, receive of her plagues, because God hath remembered their iniquity her iniquity. So we were not pointing fingers, but we want to make sure that you understand that the whole world is pointing fingers at you and they are laughing at you. We are not laughing at you. We want to get you out of that system. But they are laughing at you because you don't understand their game. With the whole story of the state of Israel over there in the Mediterranean. They have written the script years ago and now they are building the stage to perform their play they have planned all along to deceive the whole world. When you watch videos like this or listen to audio recordings like this, we pray that this will be Maybe your awakening that you will not be deceived as probably most of the people in the world are. So, until next time, and another work from Hour of the Truth meets Inquisition Update, we say goodbye to the origin of futurism and preterism, written by Paul Owen and Charles Jennings here. And until next time, God bless you. Juggler 66 from Hour of the Truth signing off. Bye-bye. We must start at the foot of the cross. For our souls in danger, we're at loss. And when we kneel in that awesome place, at that very moment, you'll feel God's grace. Friend, let me tell you, you need to know, there is heaven, also hell below. 
Christ died on that cross to set you free from your vile sins and hell's agony. You're God's enemy without the cross. Reject Christ and to God your dross. To the prison of hell he will send just Christ's work on the cross makes amends. God hates those who try to enter in the gates of heaven still full of sin. Only his son can take sin away and go to the foot of the cross this day. God has provided only one way to enter heaven's wondrous array. Except what Jesus did for us all, he paid our debt so hell won't befall. Go to the foot of the cross this day, his precious blood washes sin away. We each need to think more of his cross, without our Savior we're total loss.